Hi, everyone. Welcome and good afternoon here in the Midwest. Uh, my name is Kate Sample. I'm with Pessy Publishing, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here this afternoon for our free event. Um, we've got over 6,600 people signed up today, which is just unreal. Um, and, and it definitely indicates how popular our speakers are today and how um, impactful their work has been. Um, they are two longtime PESI family members, uh, internationally renowned trauma experts, and authors of two of our newest books, Transcending Trauma by Dr. Frank Anderson and Transforming the Living Legacy of Trauma. I'm more than thrilled to introduce Dr. Frank Anderson and Dr. Janina Fisher. Please come on. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <clears throat> welcome, welcome, welcome. It looks like we have upwards of 800 to 1,000 people on so far. So let's give people another minute. Um, we're so happy to have you here talking about such an important topic of relational trauma, a, a term we're hearing more and more. Uh, it's been around for a long time, but we're hearing it more and more. And I was thinking about this, just such a such a hallmark of trauma is this emotional numbing, right? And, and learning more about that. We talk about trauma as a whole a lot here at PESI and in, in our various continuing education avenues. But to, to talk specifically about numbing, I just am super excited about, and I can't wait to hear um, all of your thoughts. So I'm going to jump off. You guys start when you're ready. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I would imagine that we have a lot of people because numbing is so hard for the therapist, often harder for the therapist than for the client. <laughs> I totally agree. And I, I, it's one of those things, it's like, um, one of my clients said this, Janina, like the silent killer. You know, it's that, it's the absence of that is really profound and really powerful, right? So, um, I'm thrilled to, uh, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here with Janina. Uh, dear, dear friend, I don't even know, Janina, how many years we go back. Um, 1995. The, 1995, is that what it is? Okay, so you're really aging both of us in a big way here. We go back a long way. It's beautiful. It's such a wonderful, lovely friendship. You know, personal friendship, as well as work work and colleague friendship for many, many years. We both, um, I think we did meet at the first time at the trauma center with Bessel van der Kolk really? in 1995. Um, but yeah, no, I'm excited. I'm excited for everybody out there. Uh, so welcome to all of you that are out there joining us today. And as you already referenced, Janina, super excited about kind of helping and talking with clinicians and also with clients around this issue of emotional numbing because it's not talked about so much and it is kind of one of these silent below the radar yet yeah. incredibly packed, impactful and powerful. I once did a workshop where I took a poll of the audience <clears throat> and asked how many people find it harder to work with suicidality, with client anger and demands um, or numbing and numbing one. Yes. Right? Yeah. The therapist would rather have a client who is suicidal, who is difficult, challenging, yeah. attacking, than to have someone who can't feel. Totally, totally. I want to, if it's okay, I mean, so just to let people know, so Janina, there, you guys all have packets of our slides, so all the content is there, and Janina and I are going to be sharing and talking together. Uh, periodically, we're going to be stopping for some questions. So Kate's going to help us with, que with questions. So if you want to type in the Q&A section, if you have any questions, feel free to do that. Kate will help uh, regulate those, monitor those, and we probably won't get to all of them, but we'll do the best we can. Um, but if it's okay, Janina, I want to share a personal story about numbing, interestingly enough, like it just reminded me when you said, you know, take a poll of, of the people in the workshop, numbing used to be so hard for me. It, it was one of these, you know, clock watch, oh my God, like five, five minutes has gone by, this is a 50 minute hour, I don't know what I'm gonna do with myself <laughs> for the next 45 minutes. You know, it was really, really difficult and challenging for me. And, you know, as you and I both do this work all the time around 
what IFS calls, and Janina talks part lang parts language forever, is therapist parts, or the parts of us that get mm -hmm. activated, right, in the numbing scenario. I was shocked to, to explore, find out what was happening for me, Janina, and I want to share it with you. Yeah. And if it's okay, and I want to share it with everybody because it was really surprising. I'm much more an activated person. I could be with hyper arousal so much easier. It's kind of old home week for me and my Italian family, right? And the numbing and disconnection was so difficult. And one of the things that was so surprising for me as I kind of went inside for my own exploration of why, Frank, why is numbing so challenging for you? It went right to my young attachment issues. It mm -hmm. brought up my attachment issues like this because the numbing that my clients were experiencing for protection for their own system really triggered the parts of me that felt lost and abandoned by their numbing. And it was really surprising for me. I, I, I was just so shocked. And over the years of being able to work on those young attachment wounds of my own, I can sit with numbing in a very different way now. Like it's a whole different experience, which I'm just so grateful for. But I was really surprised to see that that was at the root of my issues with numbing. So I just wanted to share that as you brought that up. And isn't that so interesting? Because I come from this very intellectual, disconnected family. So I've always been more comfortable with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Sure. yes you know, it's like, it's, it's, I mean, maybe because I had to get through my parents' numbing yes. that it's kind of, it just feels like just another, another day, no more difficult than than clients who feel too much. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. Oh my God, I love I love the the polarity, right? The co the commonality and the polarity. So it's old home week for you. You know, it's kind of I, I, here we go again, another day in that way. Right. And for me, it was yeah. very activating, even though the absence of as we're talking about. Oh, that's really interesting. So one of the things I hope everybody out there. Um, can start thinking about and exploring for yourself, like what in this realm of numbing, what is challenging for me? If I'm a client or if I'm a therapist, as Janina and I have shared, like what makes it challenging for you? I want to really kind of throw that out there for you yeah. to start getting curious. Because as, as you see, there's a range of different reasons why it can be challenging. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, does it feel like a rejection? Does it, you know, when clients are stuck in the numbing, yeah. I think we feel stuck. Oh, so that it isn't just, okay, this person who's suffering is stuck. It's yeah. like, I'm stuck. I'm being, yeah. I'm being <clears throat> prevented from helping. That's the heart's biggest challenge for me yeah. is I'm being prevented from helping. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. And, and it really is... I don't think it's something that we talk about much. And I don't think it's something that we teach a lot of, you yeah. know? Um, and interestingly enough, like oftentimes my assumption is numbing is associated with neglect, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not only associated with neglect, right? We're gonna, we'll talk today a little bit about all the all the origins, if you will, or are the root causes of numbing in this way. But it's one of the things that often makes the numbing even more challenging for me is when it's connected to neglect, because it's the absence of response connected to the absence of connection. Right. 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 Absolutely. So I'm going to start out and talk a little bit about numbing from a more somatic perspective. <clears throat> and then Frank will talk about it more from a parts perspective, but we'll touch on both. So let's see here. So let me start by reminding us all that, that as soon as our clients get in touch 
with their fear of remembering, it instantly brings up the fear of feeling. As Remark wrote after the First World War, it's too dangerous for me to put these things into words. I'm afraid they might become gigantic and I'd be no longer able to master them. Or Appelfeld, the moment any Holocaust memory or shred of a memory was about to float upwards, we would fight against it as though against evil spirits. So as soon as we invite remembering, our, our clients defensive systems, their fear systems are going to engage, right? And what happens is we, we, we have a choice of five uh, defensive systems. We can cry for help, which human beings are better at than animals because we have words. We can fight. Um, animals are actually better at fighting, which is I think why humans developed weapons. We're not as fast on our feet, but we have many subtle ways of fleeing. We can freeze in fear um, or we can submit in shame and humiliation. Yeah. That's it, that's our repertoire. We, we don't have any other choices. So all, all five of those survival responses block emotion. Because when we go into a fight response, our bodies prepare for action, not for feeling. Imagine you're ready to fight and you burst into tears. It's not going to be very effective. Same with flight, right? We immediately feel the impulse to move. In freeze, we feel terror and the body tenses, it freezes. So we, it, it actually supports invisibility, right? If you freeze, you can't speak or move even if you want to. In submit, in a feign death or submission response, we collapse, we, we flop, right? We often uh, people talk about freeze or flop as the two options. And then in a submission response, we go numb, which facilitates submission. So much easier to submit if your muscles are floppy, if you can't move, not because you're frozen, but because you have no energy and you don't feel anything. In the cry for help response, we feel a desperate sense of needing connection. But when we're crying for help, we don't cry. It's when help doesn't come that we might feel sadness. So when we're trying to survive. Nina, could I, could I interrupt and go back? Because you said something super important that I want to make sure people get. It's a super important point. And this was this issue of these trauma responses fight against emotion. And, the, and I just want to highlight that for everyone out there, because I, for many years, were confused that trauma reactions were feelings. Right. Okay. And what Janine is talking about here, everyone, I just want to highlight this is all these big reactions or the numbing or the dissociating or the fighting and screaming and reacting are reactions to trauma, not feelings. Right. These reactions actually protect from emotion. And I think people confuse those two things all the time, Janina. So I'm really glad you brought that up. And I just wanted to highlight that before you move on to differentiate trauma reaction from feeling. So please, please Very go ahead. No, thank you for underlying, because I'm thinking the fight response often gets mistaken for the emotion of anger. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's a very important point. Yeah. And, and it really is important in therapy. If we have a client who's having trauma responses, yeah. 
that's a whole different piece of work than a client who's having emotion. Exactly. Yeah. So, you, you know, as, as uh, Bessel van der Kolk says, the body keeps the score, but the client's survival responses, i.e. body, tell us more about how the client survived than, they, than it does about what happened. So whenever we have a client who's numb, who dissociates, who disconnects the moment an emotion is felt, um, that tells us how the client survived. If the client disconnects from emotion and fights, we know this is a client who had to fight, even at the at some tiny age, if the client submits and goes numb, we know that's the story of how the client survived. Yeah. Because numbing is so essential for submission. Imagine if you had to submit without numbing, it would be even more horrific. And, and so it's very important we can't feel vulnerable in the face of danger, right? That's, it doesn't work. It doesn't facilitate survival. We can feel vulnerable as a result of what happened. And that's what we want when we ask clients to get in touch with their emotions. But if they're in the midst of a trauma response, they can't do that. So this is the problem with a traumatized nervous system, right? Trauma results in too much emotion or hyperarousal, too much action, also typical of hyperarousal, or it results in, in too little, in parasympathetic, unable to take action, unable to speak, unable to feel, unable to be fully there. And, uh, and a very, very narrow window of tolerance, meaning very, very little ability to tolerate either extreme. And so often, I, I mean, I'm sure this is true for you too, Frank. I have clients who come to me saying, I want to feel, yeah. but wanting to feel doesn't mean your body's going to let you, yeah. right? Or your parts are going to let you, right? Wanting to feel is, is one part, but yeah. it takes work with many other parts to actually connect to emotion. And this stop sign is a reminder. When we're threatened and we're in high sympathetic arousal or we're in low parasympathetic arousal, the prefrontal cortex shuts down. So we lose access to the observing mind. We lose access to DBT skills, to perspective, to um, all the things we agreed with our therapist to do. Um, and we lose access to good judgment. And that, with that comes a host of other clinical problems. We have to remember that emotions are dangerous in the context of relational trauma. I immediately think of our shared client, Frank, mm -hmm. who grew up in exactly that, in a family where emotions were dangerous yeah. for children to have. Um, I'll give you something to cry about. I mean, she always says her mother's favorite words were, somebody is going to cry tonight. Um, meaning somebody is going to get hurt tonight. And so whether it's physical abuse, whether it's humiliation, 
Um, you know, in abusive families, positive emotions are also dangerous. Um, feeling happy, feeling proud, God forbid, feeling excited, all emotions are dangerous in the context of relational trauma. And when we're little, I always say to my clients, children wear their emotions on their sleeves, right? which you and I know as parents, right? Very it's well. very clear, right? And so the only way you could protect yourself, I tell them, was by disconnecting from the emotion. Because if a child feels it, it's gonna show. Yeah. And so the mind and body organize to, to close access to any feeling which was dangerous, which is why our clients often say, I don't cry. People in my family don't cry, right? As the tears are starting to fall. I'll, I'll say something personal again. It was, it's, and this is kind of a little family joke of mine with my, um, <clears throat> my kids. <laughs> my husband kind of knows what I'm talking about, but I've become a real crier. Okay. And we watch TV, we'll watch a, a um, commercial. And all of a sudden I start, you know, tearing up, Papa, stop crying. Oh my God, there goes Papa again, crying. Oh, wow. Papa's crying again. You know, <laughs> and what, here's my response, Janina. I was like, it took me a long time to be a, to be emotional. I've spent a lot of money in therapy to be able to cry at the drop of a hat because I was totally one of those people who, who needed to think and learn in order to protect and survive and survive, right? So my intellect was my salvation. And I was so, even though I'm an expressive outgoing person, I had very little access to feelings. So the, the responses that Janine is talking about and very well <laughs> versed within my system took a long time to be able to relax, to allow that emotion to come through. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's, I always say, I didn't learn to cry till I was 40. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, it's, it was just too dangerous in a lot of ways and in a lot of families and, for all kinds of reasons. Right. And in my case, I didn't have any, well, I had a belief, my mother will not like it if I cry. But most of it, I think, was really my body had learned to avoid crying. Yeah. And yeah. so then we have another problem, <clears throat> which is we and the client have different agendas. Yeah. They come to us because they want to feel better. We don't say to them, you know, therapy involves deepening into your emotions. So you will come to feel better, but it may not feel always feel good. And, and so then we go along, the client still thinks I'm here to feel better. We still think we're here to access those deep emotions. And, and we forget that we haven't gotten the client's consent to all this vulnerability. That's right. And as the client picks up that that's where we want to go, often clients begin to feel a sense of threat, right? Because we want them to remember. We want them to feel. And it's a very subtle struggle. We don't verbalize the struggle, but week after week, there's this, this push-pull where we try to help the client deepen, the client resists, we try harder, the client resists. And, and we forget that this is a two-way struggle because we have an agenda, but the client has an agenda too, and they don't always match. I, I love the idea, Janina, of actually, uh, you know, I don't do this as much and I'm really, grateful for you to be able to be naming this is to make that agenda more explicit 
Like yeah. people come in and they don't come in saying, I'd like to heal my unconscious childhood wounds. <laughs> They're <laughs> unconscious. Hello. You know, and that's oftentimes the, the agenda when they, we know of all their symptoms, drinking, binging, depression, anxiety is those protective responses in root of underlying trauma. I love the way you're saying, wow, what we have very different agendas and what if we can kind of be more mutual or get on the same page, people want to feel better, not connect to their relational wounding. So right. I love that you I love that you bring that up. It's really important. And at least at least we can have a collaborative mutual agreement. That's right. And also we have to remember that the deepening into emotion doesn't feel like healing to the client. The client starts to cry and we say, good for you. But the client doesn't feel a, a sense of good for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> That's where parts language help. I always say, I always say to clients, isn't this wonderful? There's a part of you that still knows how to cry. So just, just let that part have her tears because often that feels less threatening. <clears throat> In the model, the parts model that I use, which is the structural dissociation model, we understand the parts as driven by these survival instincts so that, um, so that the, the parts don't so much hold what ha did happen, they hold the anticipation that it will happen again. Um, the world still feels like a dangerous place. It doesn't feel as if that was then and this is now. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and as Frank is going to talk to you more about self-energy, but in this model, what I do is I try to bring together um, what I think of as some of the best pieces of IFS, along with the best pieces of structural dissociation. And I help the left brain part of the client that has kept on keeping on to become um, more filled with self-energy, more calm, more compassionate, more connected um, so that the healing, which I, I agree, I am in total agreement and I, I thank Dick for this idea that healing is, is the self-healing. It isn't the therapist healing. That gives us too much power as well as too much responsibility. So let me just, let me just quickly say what the self is, as Janina mentioned it. And then maybe Janina, it may make sense for us to take a, a bit of a pause and answer some questions if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, right? good. Wonderful. So just for those of you who don't know what Janina is referring to around this idea of self energy, it's a concept that certainly Dick didn't create, but it's the way he organized it within the model. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the model of IFS says that everybody has this thing we call self energy. It's kind of our essence, it's our core, it's internal wisdom. Everybody has it. We believe that you're born with it. We believe that everybody has it. And we believe that traumas can help block access to it. So some of the work that we do is to help people clear their blockages so they can access their internal wisdom, their internal healing capacity, the way they, their intuition that knows what's right and what needs to happen. So I just wanted to give a, a frame of that. And those words that Janina puts up there are the, are the kind of descriptors of self-energy, you know, the, the eight C's of self-energy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So why don't we take, why don't we bring Kate back? Kate, are you here with us? Why don't we bring Kate back and maybe you can go through a couple of questions and then we'll continue. I would love to. This is just 
been a fantastic start. There's been a lot of great questions and comments and people are loving the dialogue between the two of you. Um, I've asked everyone to vote for questions using the little thumbs up feature so I can kind of prioritize what the audience right. is wanting to hear from you. So far and away, the, the most popular question at this point is, um, is about chronic pain and whether or not chronic pain is related to unresolved trauma and whether or not that's an unresolved trauma response. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> you want to go first? You want me to go? <laughs> I, think, I think we both... I think we would both agree on the answer. We could yes. maybe we'll just nod at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually use the model of Robert Scare, who who's the author of The Body Bears the Burden, mm -hmm. who talks about a number of chronic pain and chronic medical conditions as unresolved traumatic memory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think we both work with those unresolved traumatic memories on the assumption they're held by parts. Sure. Totally. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll just add a piece from the IFS perspective. Yeah. Interestingly enough, some people know that some people don't. The way IFS became an evidence-based treatment was actually a study done on rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. So it was really? a study done on rheumatoid arthritis. And we, we did um, a piece of work with people who suffered from rheumatoid arthritis. There was a drug comparison to IFS. And time and time again, when they started working with the parts of them that locked up their jaws, that, uh, locked up their joints, made them unable to move, it was an attempt by a part to have the person not caretake others but caretake mm -hmm. themselves. So mm -hmm. it was an attempt to take care of oneself and an attempt to help and heal. So, you know, and Gabor Mate is another person who speaks about almost like all, he makes the bold statement of all medical problems, medical issues are related to trauma. So it's certainly something that Janina and I feel very strongly to and, and really work with in a compassionate way, the mm -hmm. parts that show up in the body through chronic pain. Yeah, absolutely. Right, the, the, and think about the, the ACEs study, which I'm sure many in our audience are familiar with. And just, you know, just this, the statistical association right. between so many diseases um, and, yeah, yeah. and adverse childhood events. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, you, you really can't ignore that at this point, you know, that connection between the two. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's do uh, one more and then we'll, we'll, we'll sure. go back. Wonderful. Sure, yes. This one relates back to something that you um, spoke about a little bit, Frank, was the, um, the difference between the differenti differentiation, excuse me, you made between a trauma response and an emotion. Um, so the question really is, so do they not, do they not feel the emotion during that response, whatever that action or behavior is? Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I'll elaborate personally on that. And I kind of referenced that a little bit because um, a trauma response is very overwhelming, but it's, in, it, it's very overwhelming in the ways that Janina is talking about physiologically, mm -hmm. okay? Especially if it's hyper arousal. So the body is activated, the heartbeat is racing, you know, there's, there's, there's an activation physiologically, which is different than a feeling or an emotion. Okay, mm -hmm. so that somebody can feel sad, someone can feel happy, someone can feel loving, like that's a that's an emotion that is also can be felt in the body, but it's a very different physiological, you know, the window of tolerance that Janina talked about. And as we're talking about today too, the same with numbing, okay, which is a physiological reaction, mm -hmm. cuts off all emotion, okay, cuts off the body sensation, like there's a shutdown that occurs. So those reactions are very different physiologically and they're experienced very differently depending on where somebody is on that you know, scale that Janina showed, hyper arousal, window of tolerance versus hypo arousal. And that window of tolerance might be that sweet spot where people are able to actually feel emotion, but a lot of trauma survivors don't spend much time in that window, that's for sure. Yeah. Right. And their, and their relational trauma, you know, the theory is that 
it's good attachment that builds a window of tolerance, right? right? And I see this in my granddaughters who have amazing windows of tolerance for teenagers. Our, our clients didn't have the opposite of good attachment. So of course there's this very narrow window. And I, and I really think we can think about in our own lives, you know, the, the when we have a trauma response versus when we have a, just an emotion. So I'm thinking, I was thinking as you were talking, Frank, I was thinking about a particular angry client um, who was very, I, I don't want to say that she was intentionally intimidating, but when she got angry, it was intimidating for me. And I remember one day as I was listening to her angrily tell me what I had done wrong this week, um, I felt my body tense. Like I was, I stopped paying attention to her and I paid attention to what was happening in my body. And I could feel heat. I could feel tension. And I got, if I speak while my body is tensing and defended, it's going to simply trigger her more. Right. And so, because in that fight response, even if we don't say I'm angry or this is unacceptable, our body tension is going to show up in our voice and body language. And just as you know, I'm sure we all have had experiences of feeling defeated and deflated. Yeah, that's right. right. And you just could feel your whole body kind of given up. You know, what's the point? And, and so we all have those defensive reactions all the time. We just have them in a milder form because hopefully we're not being traumatized all the time. Right, right. Well, and it speaks to what you, the both of you brought up early on, which was doing your own work as a therapist, doing your own parts work and understanding your reactions to things. Um, and, and that's a wonderful example of that, of knowing that you felt intimidated and you felt that if I were to speak, it, it wouldn't go well, right? And so you had that knowledge. Um, that Actually, what I, what I was noticing was, I was having a defensive reaction. Defensive, yes. And so that's, and if I was just having an emotion, it would have been easier to work with. Yeah. Um, if sure. I wasn't. That makes sense. Right. That's this piece that I, you know, if anybody, if, if there's a one takeaway for me around emotional numbing, it's the protective quality of it. Because most people don't really appreciate or be, or have that awareness that this, disconnect, this numbness, this absence of is actually trying to help me here. That's what Janina was describing. There's the protective nature of emotional numbing because most people don't like it. They want to get rid of it and they're going to do everything they can to stop it instead of really appreciate it for the protective quality, the protective intention um, that it really is trying to do. I think that's so important to pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to hop uh, off and you guys carry okay. on. <clears throat> All right. And I'm just going to just finish up a, a few remarks because I want to hear what Frank has to say. Beautiful. <laughs> right. So I like to think about deepening without deepening, right? Because the more I help the client be comfortable with even a little bit of emotion, the more the protective instinct is, or the protector part is going to relax around the emotion. So I keep the focus on the feeling memory and on the parts rather than on the events. I acknowledge the traumatic events without asking the client to talk about them because I know that talking about them um, triggers the protector parts. But if I acknowledge what happened, if I acknowledge the protector parts, if I acknowledge, I know, I know the protector parts don't want you to talk about this, 
Um, but is it okay with them if we just acknowledge how hard it was? Can we acknowledge that you have a little part whose heart was broken? Is that okay? Um, and I find that the protectors, as Frank does too, you know, if you ask permission of protector parts, yeah. they're usually amazingly willing, mm -hmm. at least to meet, you know, to meet you halfway. I try to help clients develop what I call their emotional muscles. I don't talk so much about the window of tolerance. I talk a lot about strengthening those emotional yeah. muscles, right? And inviting the protector parts. Would it be okay with the numbing part to let Mary feel just 10% of the little part sadness? Could the spacey part open up that gate just a little tiny bit? And again, that being willing to say, you only have to feel 5%, 10%. Protect your part, you only have to let in one person. I mean, I'm happy with one percent, yeah. you know. Work backwards, start in the present moment, start after all the worst has happened, because that's less threatening. Um, I use the body rather than pull it. If people are emotionally numb and phobic. I go for gesture and movement. And, and the more, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm thinking of our mutual client. The word self is triggering for her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if I say, <clears throat> if I use this, this is my symbol for, for really for, for clarity, but it's for, you know, the observing mind. That's okay, right? And let go of your own need for the client to deepen. I try to let go of my need mm -hmm. for the emotion, for the deepening in every cell of my body. Because when I let go of my need for people to feel, it's usually easier for them to feel. Um, and we have to admire the ability of their parts, their bodies to achieve numbing. You know, that numbing is tough, right? Yeah. Right. You and I might have, have been taught not to cry as children, but, but numbing, not being able to feel anything is, is actually an extraordinary accomplishment of the mind and body. And remind yourself that a client has a right to, to numbing. I find that easier. If I say, you know, this client has a right to be stuck. This client has a right to be numb. It relaxes me. And I'm sure that uh, Frank would agree with these wonderful words from Mark Epstein when those aspects of ourselves that have been unconsciously refused are returned, when they're made conscious, accepted, tolerated, or integrated, the self can be at one. The need to maintain the self-conscious edifice disappears and the force of compassion is automatically unleashed. And I, and I think that really speaks to how both of us work is, is through unleashing, unleashing the force of compassion in ourselves and in our clients. Either or both is good. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a, actually a beautiful segue with, for my first slide. So thank you for that, Janina. And I wanna go back to something that Janina said that is super important uh, to highlight this because it's actually, it's IFS has this component, but I learned this from you, Janina, years and years ago, this sliver of memory concept, you know, mm -hmm. you've, you, 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 you've coined that term for me, sliver of memory. And this point that I want to make for everybody out there is 
the, the way our systems, client systems, have the capacity to share a little at a time. Okay, super important. Most clients don't even know they have that capacity. So we have to help them with that. IFS calls it dealing with the overwhelm. And that this ability in most parts storm the gate because they want help. They get yeah. flooded and overwhelmed because there's a traumatic reaction and they're just wanting help. And so this way Janina is talking about breaking it down into 1% or 2% is really important. It's the way to have people be able to be with the unspeakable, be able to be with the intolerable in a way that is not reliving, in a way that's therapeutic and healing. Dropping the content, dropping the words, you know, holding it in the body, in position, all those things that Janina is talking about here are really uh, tried and true ways of being able to be with overwhelming things in a way that's safe and more manageable such that the numbing and the disconnect doesn't have to step in and shut it all down. So I just wanted to highlight that piece that's super important around how do we do this? Like how do you stop the numbing, for example? And you know, you, we appreciate the numbing as Janina is saying, we value the numbing and we offer these alternatives to being able to be with the unspeakable, the horrific, the traumatic. All right, is, is it okay for me to, yeah, to put up it. a couple slides? Is that right? Great, yeah, wonderful. Um, and then we will, I'll put up a couple slides and then we'll take some questions too again. Um, well, that's not, I don't wanna put up the last slide. I'll put up the first slide, but I'll have to go back <laughs> to see how that happened. Let's go back like this. Okay, <clears throat> so um, this is the slide that I wanted to put up first because this is kind of dovetails the last slide that Janina puts up. This is a, my favorite quote, quote from my book, Transcending Trauma. And it was it, the re, partly the reason it's my favorite quote, honestly, is it's not my quote. <laughs> it's a quote that came to me. It kept, when I was writing this book, just over and over again, I kept getting this download of information. And I would go for runs after writing all day. Trauma blocks love. Trauma blocks love would just repeat over and over again in my head. And I really experienced that personally, too, is the way that trauma blocks love, our essence, who we are, that thing we called self-energy. And interestingly enough, the other side of the story kept coming up in my head, too. Love is what heals trauma. Love is what heals trauma. So for me, it became this cyclical mantra, the cyclical mantra of trauma blocks love, blocks access to who we are. We're born with the core. We are that core. That core is full of love. Everybody has it, even if they don't believe it or feel it. And it is that very love essence, self that Janina was talking about, self-healing, that is what heals trauma. So I just want to send that message out to the world. That is really something that's super important to me. And I feel the more we do this work, the more we do this work collectively, not only Janina and I, but everybody else out there, the more we're going to be able to help people be able to release the trauma that they carry and to be able to feel more of their self and their love, which will only be contagious. So for me, this is a, this is a global mission at this point for as many people as possible to be able to get this message, learn about this, learn how to do it so that this trickle effect will happen. We can create this web of healing in the world. Um, let me back up here. This was, I think we've mentioned a lot of these things, but these are some of the difficulties um, that happen that make this numbing so hard, that make this numbing challenging. Okay, there's a lot of boundary issues that come up. There's a lot of comor comorbid um, conditions that come up that we've already talked about. The extreme symptoms, which numbing and disconnection and dissociation is one of those extreme symptoms, that extreme absence of in the service of protection. And of course, we talked about therapists' parts as a huge piece. Janina talked a bit about the neuroscience of um, numbing and dissociation. I'm gonna add a couple components. This is 
comes um, from some of the studies of Ruth Lanius. She did some neuroimaging studies. And the side, you know, for years, honestly, I've done workshops for Bessel for years and years and years at his trauma center around the neurobiology of PTSD as it relates to hyperarousal. For years, we knew about the neurobiology of sympathetic activation. That's all of what we were looking at. Now, thankfully, thanks to people like Stephen Porges and Ruth Lanius, we can, um, and Joe Ledoux, which I'll talk about in a minute, we can look at the other side now from a neurophysiological perspective. And one of the things that the, some of the neuroimaging studies really looking at people who were blunted, numbed out and disconnected is that the neuroimaging studies show they had high cognitive suppression. So very high capacity to suppress. And it was a top down suppression, meaning we shut things down from the top down, shut down thoughts, shut down emotion, shut down physical sensation. So there's this top down suppression that creates the state of numbing, that creates the state of dissociation and disconnection. Joe Ledoux's work shows us there's a part of the brain called the amygdala. It's kind of our emotional uh, center in a way. When things are emotionally significant, they go unconsciously and quickly to the amygdala, and of course, more slowly to the prefrontal cortex. But in those extreme examples that Janina was talking about, the amygdala activates a certain part of the brain called the ventral striatum. And you don't have to memorize any of these terms, people. That's not the point here. The point is, under that extreme condition, beyond fight and flight, in the numbing submit, the ventral striatum gets activated and activates the escape avoidance pathway within our bodies. So there's a brain thing that happens. There's a body thing that happens that says, holy crap, this is life-threatening. This is super dangerous. Stephen Poor just talks about that dorsal branch activation that numbs and shuts everything out. So I wanted people to just know a little bit that there's science behind this, that this is not just theory anymore. We really know the science behind numbing and dissociation, which is very helpful. This little chart is a chart that you would find in, in this book, Transcending Trauma. And I just wanna point out kind of the steps that I go through when somebody's numb, okay? What I do um, as an IFS therapist and what I do now since I no longer get pissed off and frustrated when somebody gets numb, like I talked about in the beginning, right? Oh my God, I used to get so frustrated. Now I could really be with hypoarousal, with emotional numbing in a very different way. Janina says, wow, how wonderful they can do this. Wow, I know there's a really good reason for this. So I have a lot of compassion for this now. What I do is I'm noticing the energy of my client. Is that energy high? Is that energy low? What energy is coming at me? Not the words, the energy, right? Really important distinction. And then I'm gonna assess how shut down are they? Can they move their body, their fingers? Can they breathe? Can they look at me? How shut down are they? Are they able to hear me? Can they feel anything? So I do a little assessment. Can you wiggle your fingers? Are you able to feel anything? Can you hear me speaking? When people are so shut down, they are disconnected totally. So I'll do a little assessment to see how shut down, no pressure, just an assessment. Then I check in with my parts. Am I clean? Am I clear? Am I okay? Am I relaxed and open? Because the more I push shut down, the more shut down the client will get. Pushing makes it worse. The other thing I'll say with this shutdown is empathy tends to be more useful than compassion, interestingly enough. And Janina has heard me talk about these distinctions between empathy and compassion. When we're empathic, we're warm and fuzzy and we're resonating with emotion. And that's more useful for clients who are shut down. 
if we stay too cognitive or too distant, it can feel distancing for them. So I tend to be warm and fuzzy, not pushy, mm -hmm. when my clients are hypo aroused or shut down. I want to join them in feeling. I want to help from the bottom up them be able to help bring their systems back online. So empathy, not pushiness, important distinction is super important when somebody is numb. I'm here with you. I care. I'm going to be here for as long as it takes. No pressure. And I want them to feel my warmth. I want them to feel my heart. Okay. The last thing I'll say is if they're really in that shutdown space, it's really disconnected. There's no access to any prefrontal cortex, as Janina talked about. No access to self-energy. We do this thing in IFS called direct access. My parts will talk to their shutdown part. Wow, something really big's going on here. You're really struggling. I'm sure there's a really good reason for it. Tell me more. I'm really curious to hear. So I'll engage in a discussion directly with that numbed out part, knowing it's there for a reason. There's a really important reason why it's doing it. And I'm curious to get to know it a little bit better. So I just wanna share with you some of the steps to give you some practical steps around how we may manage or how I may manage this whole shutdown, disconnection, hypoarousal space. And Frank, can I add one other little practical? Please. What you just said, because yeah. sometimes when, when the client is shut down completely, and can't respond in any way, yeah. right? So we're trying direct access, you know, with the shutdown part, but nobody's nobody's home. <laughs> um, That's right. What, what I do is I say, "Can you nod your head for yes and shake your head for no?" Yeah. Um, because if they're able to, and remember, babies can do that, right? <laughs> Right, right. Babies yeah. can go no. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's such a primitive um, movement that often those shutdown parts can nod and shake their heads. And then I just ask a series of yes, no questions. And that seems to somehow unlock the, the shutdown. Yeah, that's that. What's so thank you, Janina, for mentioning that piece. That's really print basic, yes, no, bottom up. It's a bottom up, you know, it's that we're trying to bring the system back online from a bottom up. And you, some people, some clients aren't even capable of doing that, right? right? If they're really disconnected, then we're there to hold that space. And I often will see, Janina, is when there's total shutdown in that way, eventually there's just a little something happens in the body, like it shifts. And then their body, they be, they, beginning of them coming back online. I had this very cool example once of a client who got in a total shame, freeze, frozen, disconnect response. We were talking, I asked the part not to overwhelm and boom, it took over. She was totally immobile. She couldn't hear, she couldn't see. Mm. Eventually she moved a pinky which is really fascinating. And then she was able to move this whole hand. And I was just really empathically present with her. We're not pushing at all, knowing that hypoarousal is more physiologically dangerous to the organism than hyperarousal is. Yeah. Eventually she was able to fully move her body, open her eyes, talk to me. She came back. Interestingly enough, Janina, her part, the little girl, was still frozen in the bedroom back in her history. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, I had never seen that before. Mm -hmm. And so then I had my client go into that room where that little girl was frozen in her bedroom and do that same loving, unblending, unfreezing, unthawing um, mm -hmm. se sequencing with her client. She's like, she could move her finger now. She's moving her hands. She's moving all around. She's smiling. She can feel. So it was really a fascinating. My mm -hmm. client system got totally 
numbed out, help, I helped her with my self energy, mm-hmm. helped her come back online. And then beautifully, she was able to help her part inside who was also frozen, mm-hmm. come back online. It was, it was very impactful and really a powerful moment for me to be able to see how serious and important and dangerous it can feel yeah. and how we're capable of helping them kind of get out of those states. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wonder, let's, why don't we take a couple more questions and then we'll go back. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, again, people continue to comment about how wonderful this is and, and, and really appreciating the camaraderie and friendship between the two of you. Um, and the simplicity of some of the things that you're talking about, Frank, with your, with trauma and love, a lot of people resonated with that. That was wonderful. Um, again, one of the overwhelming questions here is, uh, you know, for, through the lens of trauma, how, how would you explain, um, clients who kind of, who kind of go back and forth and shift between hyper arousal and then being dissociative and shutting down? I know we're only talking about kind of one end of that spectrum, but can you speak a little bit to when people are shifting between the two? Beautiful question. Yeah. Um, Janina, you want to start there and then I'll pick up? I mean, I think there are two ways to understand it. One is that, again, it tells us how the client survived, right? Because often that sympathetic arousal is dangerous for the child who isn't supposed to move, who isn't supposed to speak, who isn't supposed to register any emotion. And so the body very quickly, early in life, even in infancy, can learn as soon as there's sympathetic activation, the parasympathetic system um, is automatically activated to shut it down. We can also understand that as parts, right? <laughs> right? As, as a you know, angry or sympathetically activated part um, who responds and then the numb part responds to the activated part. Yes. So say more about that, Frank. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, and, and I will say that the, the switches between these parts can be very quickly, can be very subtle and therapists can miss it all the time. Okay. It can, it can happen in a nanosecond. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I have a, I have a video of our mutual client that I show where I'm doing hyper arousal strategies when she's shifting between hyper and hypo different parts. And I keep doing the wrong strategy with the wrong energy, (laughs) you know, and I like, I love showing people how to mess up and what not to do, because it really was, it really, and, and, and actually she got more and more dysregulated and more and more dysphoric and more and more um, stressed, stressed for her because I was doing the wrong intervention, but only in retrospect did I realize parts were shifting so quickly. So mm-hmm. she had a numbing part that wanted to numb out all the feelings related to uh, a, a traumatic loss in her life. And she also had an anxious part that kept trying to get away by being anxious um, and getting away from the emotions. And those parts were kind of at odds with each other. They were kind of fighting each other. And IFS, we call that a polarity or a polarization. So these parts were shifting back and forth very rapidly, even too rapid for me to be able to track. Mm -hmm. So in IFS, and eventually I got, I I, I said to her, when I was able to, oh, wait a minute here, which part wants to talk to me first? So in IFS, that's what we would do. We'd say, okay, there's two parts here. Sometimes there's three or four, two parts here right now. Which one wants to talk first? I want to talk to both of them because I know they're both vying for position right here, but which one can I talk to first, knowing that each are going to get equal time. And it really changed the trajectory of the whole session because Mm -hmm. these parts that were kind of jumping in Interestingly enough, for the same reason, and they didn't know that, the Mm -hmm. numbing part was protecting the same wound that the anxious part was protecting. They were just doing it in physiologically opposite ways. And when when I talked to both sides and they saw that, 
they're like, oh, wow, they join forces. Like we have a common goal, you know? <laughs> so yeah. it can be really tricky when these parts are, you know, Wendy DeAndrea calls it mixed states, yeah. different parts, hyper and hypo arousal can almost coexist at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'll say one other thing and then she need to go ahead. This is very, very common with clients who have DID. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're not talking about two parts. We're talking about 25 parts or 30 parts. So it becomes a whole different level, same principle, increased number of parts that are shifting and switching all over the place. Right. Go ahead, Janine, yeah. you were going to say something. And I, I think, and I think, I think you're absolutely right that that ex, those extreme shifts from hyper to hypo sympathetic to parasympathetic are more, much, much, much more common in DID clients. Yeah. And, and the other thing is what I do is because, you know, my way of working is more about having the client access the part is I help the client notice that these parts are in conflict. Wow, mm -hmm. there's a real struggle going on inside you. Can you notice, because you know the noticing brain to me holds a lot of self energy, that observer self that we all have. Um, so I want, I want the client to notice the struggle, not just the parts notice the struggle. Exactly. That's exactly right. And, you know, um, what did I say about that? Yeah, I think that's, a, I think that's totally true. If they can, it's great. And if they can, I'll try and help them out. I guess that's the yeah. piece that I was going to say, because sometimes they can, we'd much rather have them do it than us. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Do you have, an, have another yes. question? Oh, um, sorry. I'll just Go do a, ahead. That's okay. I'll just do a quick one here. A couple of people from the last segment were asking, um, the first one was, what is the name of the study that you referenced, Frank, about the rheumatoid arthritis and IFS? Um, you can either, if you know it now, go ahead and say, otherwise you can email it and we'll share it. And then the book that you referenced, Janina, uh, was it Scare was the last name? If you could right. repeat that, some, some attendees were really looking to, to find those. Okay. Uh, so do you want to... Reference Nancy Sowell. Sure. Soul. So the, the Nancy Sowell and Nancy Shattuck are, are the first, first and Nancy Shattuck and Nancy Sowell are the first and second authors on this paper. It was in the Journal of Rheumatoid Arthritis. Um, and it's about IFS for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. It can be found on the IFS Foundation website. So instead of people searching for the journals on Google, you can certainly do it that way. Um, IFSFoundation.org is a non-for-profit organization. And in the research section, there's a tab that posts the, um, that study for um, rheumatoid arthritis. Cool. Um, and the Robert Scare, his last name is spelled S-C-A-E-R. And his book is called The Body Bears the Burden. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, a lot of people will as well. Um, yeah. Did you want me to do one more? Did you want to carry on? Sure, you could, do, you could do one more and then I'll, we'll jump back in. Okay, that sounds great. Um, we talked a little bit about comorbidity. Um, and one of the questions that's coming up is how do you kind of clinically differentiate between numbness um, as related to trauma and numbness as related to something like depression, um, where some of that numbness or the anhedonia or however you want to describe the, the clinical presentation, um, how do you kind of differentiate between those two? That's a great Great question too. These are great questions, by yes, the way. Yes, they are. I, I I have to say, just I just want to say I'm having so much fun here. This is really great. I love spending yeah. time with Janina, so it's super fun. It is, and yeah. I'm really I'm really grateful to all these questions because they're really people are being very thoughtful, and I just love uh, these questions. So yeah. I'll just say a little bit about the way I go around differentiating them from the IFS perspective. And from a, I'm going to say from an MD perspective, if you will. So I, I bring a little bit of my MD-ness in here, which I rarely do anymore these days. But um, so from, I have, from, the, from the IFS perspective, both are parts, whether it's a, a, a part that holds depression or a part that holds trauma. So we're, we're still looking at them as parts 
okay? Um, is it the depressed part? Is it a portion of the part that holds depression? Is it a, a trauma response of numbing and disconnection? Is it a portion of a part? So I'm always looking at what percentage of what's showing up is part related or emotionally rooted. And then I'm always trying to differentiate how much of it is biological. How much of it has to do with low serotonin? How much of it has to do with genetic passing down from family members? So for me, this differentiation is real mind-body medicine, not just in theory. And interestingly enough, parts are great at sharing information. Parts will say 80% of it's us and we're just really numb because we need to get away from this pain. But that 20%, it's not us, we're not doing it. We want help with that 20%. So for me, when I start having those discussions, there's a, they can help differentiate what percentage is biological and what percentage is emotional. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's all emotional and all biological. Rarely though, in my experience, it's usually a percentage of both. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'll say about this when I'm sussing out biology, is the biological effects usually affects all parts, not mm -hmm. just the anxious part of the biological or the, you know, the depressed part. So all parts say, yeah, we don't like that numbness. It affects the whole system. So that's another way I differentiate it. So I'll just share that and certainly hear what Janina has to say about that too. I mean, when I, you know, when I think about, I mean, again, there are so many different kinds of depression, right? major depression, quote unquote, has many different causes from situational to biological to, to what I would consider, to trauma related, right? Because the symptoms of major depression are among the most common symptoms yeah. of, of trauma. So like Frank, I assume that, that it's best to treat depression as a part regardless of its cause. I actually find it helps people even to relate to their biological depression, to understand it as a part. Right. Um, depressed parts are more often in my experience, hopeless than numb, right? They've got feeling, yeah. they've got low <laughs> feelings, right? They feel hopeless, despairing, depressed, um, right. They have terrible problems with self-doubt and, uh, not self-hatred. I think of that as a different, a part that hates the other parts. Um, but that low self-esteem that goes with depression in, in my mind, depression is not the same as numbing. Or I want to. So, Janina, you just get, I just had a little bit of a light bulb moment there that I want to share. Is listening to you, it's really interesting because so I like what you're saying when you're talking about depression as a feeling. And for me, that is when it's related to parts. Yeah. Okay. Because I also think of depression as this neurovegetative symptoms of depression, which mm -hmm. are the biological component. You know what I mean? So that's a distinction for me. I was like, oh, wow. Like when there's a, an emotion attached, it may be parts related. Mm -hmm. And when there's symptoms attached, I can't drink, I can't sleep, I have trouble concentrating, I'm not eating well, I'm hopeful, you know, all those neurovegetative signs are more biologically rooted or biologically based. So that's a, another nice, for me, distinction um, between that biology and um, and parts yeah, that and makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. And I really, one thing that I love about IFS, I've been learning in the last couple of years is how um, non-pathologizing it is yeah. um, just in approach. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, Janino, when you mentioned, you know, the depression, however you frame it is, is always a part, you know, even if it's biological, even if it's, you know, it kind of, I love that the essence of IFS, which allows you to step away from it and just see it as part of the picture, you know, so to speak, um, rather than because I think with depressed clients, it's very difficult to get them to unhook from their depression. Um, and, you know, people who are just horrendously and chronically depressed, just 
it becomes their identity. It becomes, you know, all there, it consumes them, you know, and I love that idea of being able to kind of unhook a little bit. Um, not a clinical term by any means, of course, but just, just interesting. So all right. good term. I'll hop off. <laughs> it's a good term. All right. Let's go. And, and, and I'll just, I'm just going to, it is an IFS issue for sure. This whole idea of um, the positive non-pathological approach. And just saying, I've been knowing this woman for many, many years. And one of the reasons that she's become one of these parts trauma dissociative icons in the field is because for years, right in the, from the beginning, she had a loving, positive approach to all parts. Like I just, you, that's just been inherent in your work, Janina, from the beginning is loving up all those symptoms because that's why you were doing the work when nobody else was doing it because everybody was getting pissed, calling people borderlines and being really mad at them. And Janina in her loving, beautiful voice, mothering ways, like, I think it's lovely. Let's learn more. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, you and I, we shared that for sure. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And it's a game changer. It's really a game changer. Totally. Totally. All right. So I want to talk a little bit more here and I realize we'll, and then we'll see if we can end up in a couple more questions for the end because the questions are really, really great. I just want to talk about the complexity of systems for a little bit. So this is a little bit more as we move into this numbing avoidance space into the DID dissociation realm a little bit more, because that's the, that is something that Janina and I really both have spent so much time in our careers and working with this popular, this, this, um, this side of that population. I feel like Janina, like you and I have been working with the, the most traumatized for a really, really long time. So we're very comfortable and familiar with these very severely traumatized complex systems. Um, so, and yeah, I just want to just name that. And I, one of the things I just like to do is group these complicated systems to make it a little bit more easy to understand that there's, there's often a series of extreme parts, and there could be five, six, seven, the suicidal, the cutting, the numbing, and not, not to get so overwhelmed by them, but to just, I think about this as like parts mapping. How many extreme parts are uh, in a certain system and how many parts are there to kind of um, run day-to-day -day life? A lot of functional parts within every system. There's extreme parts and there's functional parts within every system. And then which parts are underneath that are holding the pain, that are holding the trauma, either singularly or multiple traumas in there. And to just normalize, there's extreme parts, there's parts that run life, and they're all there to protect these wounds, which we're here to, which we're here to help our clients with. So I just wanna name, don't get freaked out, don't get overwhelmed, just kind of get a mapping, mapping of these systems because they're in there and you get that curiosity towards them. The other piece I wanna mention, which Janina referenced earlier and I made a, a bit reference is self, this thing we call self-energy and IFS. And the thing, this diagram depicts what kind of access really is, I call this my container theory, okay? And the more trauma that somebody experiences, the more parts they have to protect. They have tons and tons and tons of parts that need to show up for survival's sake to protect. And in the container of the human body, there's so much space. And when there's a lot of trauma and parts are predominantly taking up the space, there's very little space left for self. So access to self is little or minimal at best. And this is in our more severely traumatized clients, what we see, parts, 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 where's the self, where's the self? In contrast to someone who may have experienced a less traumatic, Whoops, we seem to have lost Frank momentarily. Oh, what a shame. Um, hopefully he'll be back here soon. Hopefully he'll be back, yeah. yeah. Do, you wanna, do you wanna maybe take a question, Janina? Sure, sure. That'd be helpful while we see if yeah. we can get back online. Great. Yeah. 
Um, one that came up that I think is just really pertinent right now is trauma related to um, uh, COVID and uh, the situation that we're in currently. Symptoms, struggling with the pandemic that's ever changing, everything's still. Wait, am I back? You are You're back. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh my God. That was so bizarre. <laughs> was so bizarre. <laughs> I was talking. I'm like, I'm here, Janina. You're not. <laughs> and then I was like, Kate, are you here? And I was like, oh crap, it must be me. So I must have had a temporary shutdown. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. That. No okay. worries at all. I'm, I'm just going to finish that. this question and then you can. We we going beautiful. Beautiful. We beautiful. Killing time while you got back on. I think. Uh, yes. We're talking about COVID and the ongoing um, yeah. trauma that a lot of people are experiencing um, and how we're continuing to adapt and change and shift. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. You want to you since go ahead, Janina, and then I'll jump in. I mean, we, we could both spend the next, the entire next 10 minutes talking. You know, COVID is a traumatic threat. It is a nationwide, worldwide traumatic threat. And, and of course, we're all having trauma responses. Yeah. Whether it's trauma responses to being isolated and less engaged in life, whether it's trauma responses related to feeling threatened um, or to wearing a mask or to getting a vaccine or to not getting a vaccine, <laughs> Right. Um, so I think, I mean, and I think it's incredibly triggering. Don't you agree, Frank? Totally. Totally. Yeah. It's, I mean, what I would say to Janina is, and uh, you know, that peop, the world is now experiencing what we've been working with for most of our careers, right. you know, and that everybody, all of us, our experience of a global trauma, you know, and the thing that's been fascinating for me, and I say this not in a, ooh, is in this cool kind of way. And it's just so similar to me for September 11th or the Boston bombing, any kind of big events like this is not only are the therapists experiencing it and then need to be helping their clients. So how do you experience a trauma and then help somebody else experience a trauma, which is very triggering and activating for a lot of people. It brings up so many hidden and unconscious traumas that were buried. That's another level. People are just layers and layers of trauma are showing up that they weren't aware of. Isolation, for example, being locked in the house brings up so many Holocaust mm -hmm. transgenerational issues. For example, this is why mental health is at a crisis right now because everybody's traumatized and everybody's re-experiencing past and present traumas. So I want to just yeah. name that. And the last without, thing, without go knowing, ahead. Without knowing. Without knowing. Right? Exactly, exactly. And then the last thing for me is watching the different phases and waves of trauma. There was the initial shock. Then there was, oh, this will be over in the summer. Then there was numb and fatigue. People, everybody were doing these Zoom calls and cocktail parties, and then they got so numbed out as we're talking about and overwhelmed, they shut down and there were no more Zoom parties. So we're seeing the phases. Oh, wait, hope when a uh, vaccine will come. Oh no, it's not for another three months. Like I, we're watching the phases, we're living and experiencing the phases right in real time, which I think is gonna be profound for all of us for years to come. Absolutely, yeah. 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 All right. So let me, I'm going to carry on. continue, carry on, and then we'll finish up here. Um, so I wanted to just name this issue of self energy that we talked about a little earlier. And I'm talking about the access to it, what, depending on the degree of trauma. Um, it's, in my view, the self is always there, we're born with it. It may just be an issue of accessing it. P clients will often say, I'm empty, I'm broken, I have no self. I respectfully say, we can agree to disagree. I know it's in there, I know you have it, you might not have access to it. I can help you access it when we are with those protective parts that are so powerfully protecting you. So I wanna just name that. The last thing I'll name about self-energy, again, which is a state of being, 
an essence within all of us is in my experience, the self never endures trauma. There's a self is protected from trauma. I've never really heard the self endure trauma. It's the poor parts that were left behind who endure the trauma. So there is a chasm that gets created between self and parts. When Janina was talking about parts not liking the self, oftentimes they hate good feelings or they hate loving feelings because parts parts can say, you left me with Uncle John. You left me behind to endure the trauma. Now we know self isn't doing this on purpose. It's the parts experience. But we also know, or I, my experience is that self is preserved. And for me, that's kind of a beautiful thing. Everybody's essence is always preserved in trauma. And that's the place we're going to help people gain access to again through the healing. I don't know if you want to say anything about again, that, Janina. I, my theory about that is that because the prefrontal cortex shuts down, when we're under threat, it, it, it kind of gives the self some protection, yeah. right? So self goes offline yeah. and the parts and the body endure the trauma. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I feel the same way. All right, so this slide just quickly, we talked about neglect a, a little bit already. I do have a whole course on neglect. You know, neglect is a whole thing in and of itself. The piece I want to talk about is neglect is often rooted in this hypo numbing side of things, not only and always. And interestingly enough, since it is this top down shutdown, I see a lot of my highly intellectualized clients who have issues rooted in wounds of neglect. So I just want people to be thinking about that, you know, the thinking and figuring out and understanding fills the void of emptiness and absence oftentimes. And these people, uh, these people, excuse me, I think Janina and I were one of them. I mean, I was one of those highly intellectualized clients who didn't have access to my, you know, to what, to my emotions underneath. So a lot of our highly intellectualized clients can have, not only have um, histories of neglect underneath, and they also really struggle with loss and letting go. If I let go, if I lose, I will have nothing. You know, as Elie Wiesel says, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. It's the absence of that is so powerful and so profound. And so why those numbing parts need to shut that down because it's often really quite intolerable. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave this lat with this last slide. And this is just some things I've collected and noticed over the years of working with clients who struggle with severe trauma and have DID. Numbers of parts, many of them extreme. They have many self-like parts we call an IFS. Very high functioning parts that learn how to maneuver in the world while inside they've endured horrific trauma. So they have many high functioning parts of themselves that act as if to function and manage. Many conflicts, many polarizations, parts form, collude with each other, live, um, form alliances, not against anybody else, all in the service of protection. They hide, they can exaggerate, they can be dishonest only to help and protect. There's often crises that happen, crisis-driven systems oftentimes. Parts can be represented symbolically in severe trauma. They can show up as a, a cat or a cave or a black box or a yellow sun, that they show up in inanimate forms. And the more you get to know them, the more they evolve into human forms. So I wanted to share that. There's often this rapid eye movement with a lot of clients with DID. We see it over and over again. And sometimes I say, oh my goodness, are they doing D uh, EMDR? 
because they're moving. You know, I think there's just part, 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 but it's something that's very common. I just wanted to share with people. And again, this issue of hating the self, you know, because from their perspective, self betrayed them or self is dangerous because every time self showed up, the perpetrator would attack. So from parts perspective, self is not such a warm, fuzzy thing. And again, it's not easily accessible. So I think I'm gonna stop there. Um, maybe- I don't know, Can I add one thing? Beautiful, to- please do, yes. Is that there are numerous studies that show that DID is widely underdiagnosed yes. and a whole series of studies by Marilyn Corzequa in Canada showing that clients with borderline personality that one third of clients with borderline personality disorder have symptoms, dissociative symptoms that would merit a diagnosis of DID. So if you have borderline clients who have that list of very difficult qualities Frank just shared, be be suspicious. Could this be a client with DID? Yeah, absolutely. Let's answer some questions. Yeah, well, we'll answer a couple of questions. Is it okay? What I've heard from Linda over at PESI is that we can go over if we want to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so oh, yeah. we don't have to. We, we can we can answer a couple more questions. For absolutely. Sure. We've, yeah, absolutely. And for those of you who need to jump off for one reason or another, you will have a recording of all of this um, probably within the next 24 to 48 hours, it should be in your account. So no worries if you need to jump off, but we definitely want to continue because we have some really wonderful questions. Um, one that I just think is so important. Um, a lot of people are asking and voting on um, talking about the epigenetic trauma responses, particularly for clients of color um, who mm-hmm. are perhaps uh, trained, for lack of a better word, not to show emotions due to societal risks or things like that. Right. How do you navigate that when there's when there's these these other factors? Wow, I mean, uh, that's such a. Th- I'll start. Well, you want to start, or you want me to start? Whichever. <laughs> okay. I'll start. It's like, wow, that's an awesome question. And you yeah. know, this, that's so, so important. And, you know, I just want to say, I'm so excited. We're getting more airtime on this stuff. Finally, 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 it's becoming an actual thing. Cause it's been around forever and ever and ever, you know, um, um, what's her name? Um, I'll think of her name in a minute. Um, uh, she's done some really important work on the epigenetic transmission of trauma. Oh, Rachel, okay. Yehuda. Rachel Yehuda. Rachel Yehuda is one of the people who's done a lot of studies on the, there is a real epigenetic transmission of trauma. So we can certainly pass down trauma genetically. I think there's 126 genes known to date in the transmission of PTSD. Oh. They're shown, they're trans, they're transmitted by sperm and by eggs. This is not just the mothers, Mm -hmm. like mothers are blamed for everything, but men and women, fathers and mothers can pass down PTSD to offspring without the offspring ever having trauma. That comes through family lineage. And, and, and we're talking about cultural trauma here too. We're talking about what gets passed down through family, you know, with the BIPOC community, with women, with any marginalized community, with Latinx community, All of these things are transmitted through family heritage and lineage and through culture, whatever culture we live in, we are being traumatized chronically in this way and it gets passed down through generations. So for me, thank goodness, this is finally getting notice and recognition because we can, the other, the real good news here is it's reversible. The studies are showing Swoomi, Ed Swoomi, who was at Bessel's trauma conference several times, shows the reversibility of these epigenetic transmissions. But if we don't acknowledge them, we can't reverse them. So the fact that they're being acknowledged is hugely important to me. And yes, there's something we could do about it. It's not that we just have to take it, but when it goes down for generations and generations and generations, Mm -hmm. IFS has a way of what we call healing legacy burdens. And it goes through the generations to get healed. Okay, so I'm thank, thanks, so glad that somebody brought that up and it's a big problem. It's getting acknowledgement finally and there's a solution to it. So I would say there's hope along the way. 
Go ahead, Janina. Absolutely. And, and so I think it's actually helpful to clients to talk about, I call it the intergenerational legacy of slavery, which has been the legacy for the African-American community. Um, the multi-generational yeah. legacy of the diaspora, which is the legacy carried by the Jewish community. Yeah. And it is so much more helpful if we can acknowledge, and we can acknowledge that in the African-American community, numbing and dissociation are adaptive responses totally. Totally. when it's necessary to submit yeah. to keep yourself safe. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Right? Beautifully and, said. Yeah, continue. Yeah. So it's it, this is an, an area that is of great interest to me. And, uh, and I hope to be doing a series um, with my good friends, Deborah Chapman Finley and Lisa Perez on implicit bias and racial trauma in the next year or so. I hope that you will. I, I think the more we can get this on the forefront of the mental health field, the better, you know? Um, yeah, it's so important. Um, I'm trying to think of another good one question. One, yeah, yeah one. Let's find one more here. One more. There you go. Sure, sure. Let's see. Um, a few people asked about um, clinician emotional numbness. Um, our our voting system isn't perfect in here, so but I am seeing some questions that are similar. So I'm going to go with this one. Um, clinician emotional numbness um, due to vicarious trauma. Um, a couple of people acknowledge that doing this work, they start to feel very numb and almost um, like, I don't know, depersonalizing isn't the right word, but it just doesn't affect them the way it used to kind of compartmentalize or kind of compartmentalizing things. And whereas others are talking about being more numb. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, you both have shared your own experiences as a clinician. Um, when, when the people who are out here learning from you, when they're experiencing their own emotional numbness, what do, what do you say or recommend or what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I actually think that that is a result of the belief, and which was part of my training, that the therapist has to go there with the client, that we have to go to that, that place of horror, pain, overwhelm. And I think that that's actually not helpful to the client. Yeah. And it's not helpful to us. Because it's, if the client is having a trauma response and an overwhelming memory, that client needs the therapist to be centered, right? To be, to be calm. I mean, again, it doesn't mean that we don't have feelings for the client, but the client needs us to stay centered. Many clients have said, it does me no good when the therapist is horrified by what I've been through, right? right? So, so I actually think therapists sh should learn how to use a little bit of depersonalization, a little numbing, conscious numbing in order to give ourselves the space so that we can be in relationship to the client and the memory, but not overwhelmed by it. Because it's the chronic experience of being overwhelmed that's going to get our bodies to start going numb. Right. Right. And I imagine I've, if you're doing ongoing trauma work, you know, um, you're, you're hearing and witnessing and, and, you know, just such horrific things throughout the day and people who are really in a lot of pain, you know, and I, and I think there's something to your point there of, you know, you don't have to join it every time. It doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to envelop you every time. Sorry, Frank, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, no, totally. I love what you're saying, Janina. And that, you know, I just use slightly different phraseology, but it's the same yeah. thing. Like uh, when, and I agree, it's not good to be in it with our clients too much. That's empathy. We're feeling too much and we will get overwhelmed and burn out. So the, there are studies that show empathic distress causes burnout and leads to burnout. And what I would say is when numbing shows up, 
it's a part jumping in that's saying, hey, you're too involved here. So I love Janina's conscious love numbing, that. right? Like if you're, if you start noticing that you're numbing out, a part saying too much here, too much here. So pay attention and listen, and then learn that appropriate space to hold the space without joining too much. So I'd rather have someone be with from self than be with because a numbing part jumps in to take care of the therapist. So mm -hmm. it's gonna happen, it's inevitable. And if you're conscious of it, it's information that you need to either see less clients, excuse me, do less hours of Zoom because <laughs> Zoom is physiologically numbing in and of itself, yeah. right? So is this numbing from Zoom? Is this <laughs> Zoom numbing? Or is this a part saying too much here, right? So for me, I always get curious when that shows up because you can hold the space. Dick used to say, it's like, he's like, I love doing therapy. I can sit here for hours doing it. I'm like, well, what are you on, man? Like, this is hard for me, right? But he was talking about doing therapy as much as possible from self-energy. Right. Because right. that's sustainable. If any parts show up, like a numbing part, get curious about it and what needs to shift within you to be able to be open instead of numb. Numb is a, is a warning signal for sure. Right. And, and I will add one other thing, which is my, my rule to, for avoiding vicarious traumatization. Yes. If the therapist is getting overwhelmed, the client is 10 times more overwhelmed. Yeah. And so that's a sign. If I start yeah. to feel overwhelmed, yeah. that's a sign we have to slow down. Yeah. We have to bite size it. We have to pace it. <clears throat> we have to bring in more self energy to, to use the IFS uh, language. Um, mm -hmm. And it's good for us and it's good for our clients. You got it. That's nobody benefits from reliving. Nobody benefits from reliving trauma. Yes. Right. Nobody benefits. Nobody benefit. Right. Reenactment is not therapeutic. Reliving is not therapeutic. So if we're feeling it, I love what Janine is saying. They're feeling it 10 times more. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, Janina. Thank you, thank Kate. You so Absolutely. Great yes. to see you. All. So you. fun. And just thank everyone else, everyone out there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being part of this web of healing and helping uh, people overcome trauma. So thanks for listening. Um, our books are available. I believe that there's a discount or some form. Yep, um, there could is. you say anything about that, Kate, for people so they know about that if they're interested? Yes, absolutely. Um, both of your books, we have a prom promotion going on Amazon. Um, the link is in the chat. It's also at the end of the handouts, um, the last slide. Okay. Um, and I will ask the PESI team here to put it in the chat one more time, and it will give you an additional 10% off of the, the lowest Amazon price for both of your books. So yes, yeah, so, which I highly recommend both of them, not only because they're PESI books, but because they're fantastic books. And part of our mission is to get the right information into people who need it to help others. So here it is, um, myth, uh, yes. Looks oh, like Maddie's putting wonderful. something up too. So perfect. Cool. Yes. Thank you both oh, so much. It was an honor so as much. always. Yes. Great to see you. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.